Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour back in our Father's Word, Book of Matthew. We're going to pick it up here in a moment in chapter 5, verse 14. Remember what he's just said. The Beatitudes have been given, and he gives you firsthand how to be blessed from Almighty God. To be humble, be gentle, follow his instructions, and then he concluded that, as in the last lecture, to be a little salty. And, if, and he's teaching people how to teach. In other words, this is not a message to the masses. He's teaching his disciples here how to teach, what to say, how to plant seeds. And he said, if, if salt loses its savor, which means its flavor, it, it's no good. Throw it in the street. So it's the same way with a preacher. If he loses his savor, if he lo loses being a little salty, he's boring. And you don't want to go there. So let the word be salty the way our Father teaches it, and um, you'll be blessed. So he continues on then, and we're going to pick it up in verse, um, uh, the, the next verse up there, verse 14. And understand the light now as he comes in with that word of wisdom from our father chapter 5 verse 14 let's go with it and it reads ye are the light of the world a city that is set on an hill cannot be hid in other words what does light do it dispels darkness and so it is when you're witnessing truth a little truth will dispel a lot of confusion got a little salt mixed in with it so that it sticks, then you know and understand that light is what God's Word is, because Christ is that light. 15. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. It, in other words, that little bit of truth dispels the darkness, the traditions of men that make void the Word of God, a bunch of nonsense and tells it like it is, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, the way our Father intends that you absorb it and to teach it. You don't, you don't have a good message. God doesn't bless you with a lot of truth, and you just sit there with it. When somebody asks you a question, you share the truth a little bit. Don't overload their donkey, but share a little bit of truth. Uh, and using good judgment, um, it's always a blessing. Verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. In other words, your good work should bring glory to our Father which is in heaven. Not yourself. You don't build a reputation for yourself. God's not in that, and, and you don't need a reputation for yourself because any gift you might have is from Him. So you, that's why the Beatitudes were just given, that you've got to be meek or humble before Him, not prideful, and He will bless you, and He will cause that light to, uh, to burn with a brightness that you cannot imagine. And what you do when you're shining that light, <clears throat> it doesn't bring glory to the world or build something great in the world. It builds greatness in Father's heaven meaning it changes men's minds, souls, bodies, and so forth into serving Him. Verse 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law, or the prophets I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Here's where many people have much trouble. They don't know the difference between law, statutes, and ordinances. And they consider it all to be law, and some even teach it was done away with, which to their own hurt, because when you, anytime you teach that, the blessings of God just left your door, because you're supposed to know the difference if you're going to teach. What did Christ say? I don't change one iota of it. I come to fulfill it, and He fulfilled the blood ordinances. 
the blood ordinances were nailed to the cross with him. They're done away with. But the law still remains. You shall not steal. It, it will always be with us because God doesn't like thieves. Okay. <clears throat> Verse 18. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass. How long is that? The end of this dispensation of time. One jot or one uh, tittle shall no wise uh, pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Now, what, first of all, what is a jot? Iota in the Greek. It means the smallest letter in the alphabet. I'm not going to change one iota of it. And what is a tittle? A tittle is just a mark that changes the sound of a vowel in the Hebrew tongue. In other words, he says, I don't change even the sound, like if, uh, whether an A is A or A, ah, okay? The dot, the tittle makes the difference there in the sound of a letter. I'm not even changing the sound of one letter of the law. Now, you know, that isn't difficult to understand, but it is uh, understandable how so many people don't know the difference between law, statutes, and ordinances. It causes confusion. Verse 19, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven, but whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. You know, um, we have a lot of people that teach the law was done away with. I'd hate to be in their shoes if they claim to be a teacher of God's word because they are leading people astray. And, you know, every sin that someone causes you lead astray, you're kind of going to answer for it yourself. That's why judgment always begins at the pulpit. So uh, beware and do your homework. Christ did not change one iota of the law. And in the next verse, probably the most understood of all. Well, what is that? Well, let's read it. Verse 20. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Why would that be? Well, it lets you know that the scribes and Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23, when we get there, they sit in the seat of Moses. Who was Moses? The lawgiver. They change it. They change the law to suit themselves after the traditions of men that make void the word of God. And any time you lead people astray, the next verse will catch more. Listen carefully, 21. You, you have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Now you see, that would be, we have, um, let's say down here in the um, prison system of Arkansas, we've got somebody that's about to be executed, and you'll have preachers show up by droves as well as Christian people burning candles, praying for the murder. Not the 12-year-old girl that was raped and killed, but praying for the murderer. And you might say, well, this says kill. That's why we don't think it's right to kill. Well, you see, you show your ignorance of the law. The word is not kill. Even in the commandments is that thou shalt do no murder. There's a great difference in murder and killing. And this, this is unfair to many servicemen even that serve this great nation on battlefields. That they've never studied the law given in Psalms 144 that says, God, give me the strength and the power to overcome my enemies, to step on them, to crush them. You know, God expects us to take care of our enemies and what, by whatever it takes to take care of business. But <clears throat> what is this, thou shall not kill here? What, what is this word in the Greek, thou shall not kill? It's, it is phanyonso comes from the prime of fonyance, which means criminal homicide. You commit criminal homicide and you're in danger of judgment because you're going to be judged and probably not make the ripple. Okay. And then you'll have a lot of scripture lawyers that'll jump on top of that because there are many different kinds of murders. There are 
uh, killings of passion. And, but it is those that lie, mean, ornery people that lie in wait and take a life. Where, where is this written? Deuteronomy chapter 19. He said, you, you've read it. You should know it. You should understand it. Well, what does it say? You're not going to have it. I'm going to read it to you. Verse 11 of the 19th chapter of Deuteronomy. Only one of the places in the Word that states this. But if any man hate his neighbor and lie in wait for him, and rise up against him, and smite him mortally, kills him, that he die, and fleeth into one of the cities, that were cities of refuge for accidental killing, such as an axe flying off the handle, or something of that nature. You, you had the, the one that this happened to flee, so the family wouldn't um, take revenge and unnecessarily. Twelve. Then the elders of his city shall send and fetch him thence and deliver him into the hand of the avenger of the blood. Who's that nearest of kin? That he may die. In other words, the father of that 12-year-old girl should be the one throttling this crook, okay, this murderer. That's biblical. That's father's way. Thine eye shall not pity him, but thou shalt put away the guilt of innocent blood from Israel that it may go well with thee. In other words, uh, if you want, and, and you know something else? If you turn on to 22, I'm going to go by memory, 22 verse 25, but if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field and the man force her, that's he rapes her, and lie with her, then the man only shall that lay with her shall die. Why? But unto the damsel thou shalt do nothing there is in the damsel no sin worthy of death, but for as when a man riseth against his neighbor, the slayer, and slayeth him, even so is this matter. In other words, rape suffers the same consequence, according to God's law. And Christ didn't change one jot, one tittle, not even the sound of one little letter. If you, you want a second witness to that, it would be, we're not going there, but it would be Numbers 35 if you want to make a home study of it. God said, hey, let the avenger of the blood kill him. Send him up here to me. I'll give him the trial he's going to have, regardless of what trials may be held on earth. God's the one that holds the final trial. And the person they murdered is that waiting there with him. And um, there, there's a fan, fantastic trial will take place. This is one that viciously lies in wait. Uh, so, and so it is. Now, don't, like I said, don't turn into a scripture lawyer. Let's say that if someone forces a man's wife or a child and the man takes his life through, in protecting the child, he's innocent according to God's law. You cannot, uh, he, he did not commit funyos, which is to say criminal homicide. He was protecting his family. That makes a big difference. So uh, you have to know both sides of the law, and you never make a decision when you only hear, hear one side of the law. That is to say what has happened in a certain case. A wise person always hears both sides. So God expects you to practice capital punishment. He said, then others will see and fear, and these things will cease happening among you. Um, but uh, you, pan you pander to the murderer and say nothing about the poor little child that was murdered, then it's going to keep happening among you. But you see, if, and this is supposed to be done publicly so that people can see. And see what happens to people that do this sort of thing viciously. I guarantee you God's law will prevail. Well, I don't know. You'll, I'll receive a lot of questions that will say, well, why does God allow this to happen? Because you won't fulfill his law. That's why. If you fulfill God's law, it'll stop happening basically overall. And, you know, and you'll have some people that are ignorant enough that they will say, well, capital punishment is not a deterrent to murder. I guarantee you, common sense, if, if you throttle an old boy that has committed murder, he's not going to do it again. We put him in a hole in the ground. Okay. He's, it's not going to happen. So it's, it's a very good deterrent. So, so again, be careful of your so-called preachers that have no salt whatsoever 
and, and do not teach God's Word as it should be taught with salt and vigor to protect God's law and allow people to change the very law of God and then wonder why we're in such a confused world. You'll have the answer right there. Okay, let's continue with the next verse, verse 22. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Reka, shall be in danger of the council, but whoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Now, first of all, let's, let's understand what a brother is. A brother is one born to the womb of Israel. That's a true brother. A neighbor is one that comes into Israel by adoption, meaning to believe upon Christ and is grafted in, so, so that we have the straight of that. So um, it's, it is not good to be angry without a cause. Why? You've got a problem. You got an ang anger management problem to be angry without a cause. Uh, it's, there's no sin in having righteous indignation when you have a cause for it to make a correction. But wh what does it mean? Wh what is this reka? Reka is, in, is an Aramaic word uh, as well as another one that will follow here that simply means, oh, you. It's, it's nothing serious. It's just like you would say, oh, you in English today. But if you call someone a fool, as it's listed here, it doesn't carry the same weight as the word fool in English. It's moros. It's where our word moron comes from. Moros uh, means a person that is void of any spiritual unction and certainly has no whatsoever divine intervention in anything. In other words, they're a hopeless case that doesn't believe in God or anything else. That's a moros. Don't, don't ever call one a, a, a brother that. God doesn't like it, especially if it's not true naturally. So, so there basically you have, many might say, well, I, I wish I could understand that better. Well, it's really quite simple. Our Father knows what people even think. They don't have to say it out loud. And this is why it's not right for you to judge. He's the judge. Because he knows their every intent. Therefore, he can fairly and always does fairly do the judging. And he takes care of business. And he takes care of it for us. That's being the reason thereof. Okay? Do his law and these things will cease happening among you. That's God's word. Verse 23. Therefore... If thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there re remainest, and, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, what do you do? 24. Leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. In other words, uh, there's a bunch of nonsense and misunderstandings all, is most often caused by lack of communication, of not understanding each other. Get down where the rubber meets the road, talk it over, get it squared away, take care of business, and then go back and ask God's blessings. Then God will bless. But if you go there with anger in your heart and expect God to bless you, you might as well leave your gift off the altar. It's not going to help you one iota. Verse 25. Agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. The adversary is one of Satan's names, and this is looking forward to the future, which Christ will get to in Matthew 24. When, when the adversary actually appears, don't disagree on the street with, um, with a, um, a, a, an individual. You, you are for the adversary. You're, you go for the head. You go for the head of the serpent. You pick a serpent up by his tail, and he's going to turn around and bite you. But I don't care, other than about one or two types of, of serpents, 
if you get them right at, behind the jaws, right on the back of the head, they can't hurt you. A python, of course, can still do damage if you're not big enough, all right, or if he's big enough. But, but a rattlesnake or something like that, you catch him by, just behind the jaws, he cannot harm you. He may rattle, make a lot of noise, a copperhead, any pit viper cannot hurt you if you catch him behind the head. So, um, but you, you mess around on the street after the Antichrist is here, uh, people that think he's the true Lord, they will hurt you. They will, they, they will without understanding because they truly believe the false Christ is the real one. Why, they haven't been taught. Never received any salt in their life, probably. So you, you, don't, you don't mess with um, the, the peons. I'll say it that way. You, you go for the juggler. You go for the main man, Satan. As, as we'll learn in the 24th chapter, that's who you're supposed to witness against. You're one of God's elect, you're a child of God, and you've got a destiny, live it. Uh, verse 26, Verily I say unto thee, Thou shalt by no means come out of thence, come out thence, till thou hast paid the uttermost forthland. In other words, it, it's, it's a waste of time. You, you understand God's word, you know where the action is, and you know where the juggler is, and you go for it. I'm talking about the enemy, of course. 27. You have heard that it was said by them of old, thou shalt not commit adultery. And, of course, you have to look at this nationally as well as otherwise, okay? 28. But I say unto you, this is what he says, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with, with her already in his heart. Now, I, I, res, I resent the way many people teach this because it drives many young people away from Christianity, drives them away from the church. There is no sin in admiring. Let's, let's say you've got a young man. Uh, let's say he's in high school or college or so forth, and, and the neighbor, she's beautiful. Well, it's God's creation. And to admire a, a beautiful work of God's creation, there's nothing wrong with that. That is not lust, though a lot of preachers will preach it as lust. To, to admire the beauty that God gives people, even, that's not lust. Lust, just to put it basically, is where you put the make on everything that moves, okay? Just your type. Well, that's, that's lust, and naturally, God, that, that's a, you, you got a sickie there, and, and God doesn't approve of it, okay? And that's what he's talking about here, okay? Not, not to, for a, if a young person is attracted to the girl next door, that is not a sin. You are very much as a Christian that God created you that way. To, to, uh, to appreciate each other, and don't you ever let anyone tell you it is a sin to admire someone's beauty or to feel led into fellowship with them. Uh, again, that is not lust, and don't ever let some preacher tell you it is, it isn't. Okay, next verse please, verse 29. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And again, many people misunderstand this. What's it talking about? All the bodies of Christ makes up the many-membered body. One organization may be the feet, another may be the mouth, and another the ear and the eye. Um, an eye is supposed to be a seer, a seer that is supposed to see truth. Uh, that's the, one of the names of a prophet, is to be able to see the future from the manuscripts, of course. But if some, some group over here starts seeing stuff that is far out, I mean, it, it, will, it is just not biblical. It, it's a bunch of, they turn into a bunch of fruitcakes. You cut yourself away from that group, for it's better you let them slide off with their nonsense than it is for it to disrupt the whole church, okay? 
God never intended anyone to harm your physical body. He gave us sight for a beautiful reason that you can see and appreciate and, and, uh, and so forth. But it has to do with the many-membered body that you don't put up with nonsense. You don't put up with the traditions of men if one of the group begins to tell weird stories of, of um, serving God in, in suspicious ways and so forth. But, and, and, and verse 30, And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off, and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Usually a hand was, uh, is, what you, is where your power is, where the strength is, especially the right hand. If, if a part of the group that is supposed to be one of the power people of the, of the groups of the uh, church of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they begin to, to mislead, to take advantage of people, to teach untruths, cut yourself away from them. In other words, usually uh, in, in old time, it would mean that they are a thief. So get away from them. Cut them away from you. They're stealing what? God's Word. And, and twisting it and turning it to where it's harmful to the body. And, and uh, what he's saying is, is, deliver yourself from false teaching. If it doesn't make common sense, if it isn't salty, if it doesn't ring true as God's Word, and, and your teacher should always teach you how to, like I said that uh, and um, a fool have a different meaning. Uh, a good teacher will give you the tools or instruct you how to acquire the tools to find out if what I said is true or not. Your companion Bible will help you or your Strong's Concordance to understand that what I'm telling you is true. That's what the Word really says. So therefore, a true teacher will always, instead of just using slogans, it's truth. Check it out for yourself. Uh, a good teacher will always want to drive you into the Word deeper for yourself, whereas a false teacher will try to cover things for you. He'll try to hide the light. A true teacher will always insist that you investigate the light and, and dig for it. Verse 31 to continue. It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a written a, a writing of divorcement. And, and there are reasons for divorce. 32, And I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. And, and it is true, if, if, if there is repentance, if two people simply were not compatible, I know I, I, a lot, I get a lot of letters whenever I, I teach this, but it's true. There, I have to believe that Christ forgives sin. And when you truly repent of a sin, it goes away. God says, I don't even want to hear about it again then you are clear of this. But without repentance, then I would be a little bit concerned. I would, but talk it over with your father. He's very understanding, very loving, and teaches repentance. As a matter of fact, he paid an awesome price on the cross that with his blood shed that you could have your sins forgiven. Always be sure you take it to him. Okay, in verse 33 to continue. Again, you have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. Um, don't ever overstate a cause. Don't make promises to God you can't keep. Okay? Don't make promises to other people that you can't keep. Don't overload your donkey. Okay? And, and it's better not to. Verse 34, But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne. Be careful about that. Verse 35, Nor by the earth, 
for it is his footstool neither by Jerusalem, that's the city of peace, for it is the city of the great king. And, and uh, so it is, 36, neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. Worry or swearing won't change one thing about you, it won't help one iota. Verse 37, but let your communications be yea, yea, or nay, nay. For whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. It's how evil can spring up. Let, let, let's talk about, you've heard me many times say I'm very much against the law of precedent rather than just straight out truth. Why? Because the law of precedent goes by what this lawyer or judge said according to what this law of judgment said, not what the law of God says. Do you understand what I'm saying? You, you listen to precedent. This, what this man says or that man says, you swear by this man, you swear by that man. Brother, listen to God's word. It is truth. And um, let it be straight on, yea or nay, yes or no, according to God's law. Uh, you're not stretching a point there a great deal for our constitution of this great nation comes from common law of Great Britain, which comes from this good old King James word. Okay, it's The law written right in there, uh, basically. Of course, there have been changes and there have been additions. But uh, originally, that's where she comes from. And that's why we have such a great constitution and such a great nation. We didn't get there by the by a law of what this good judge said or that man said, but what our forefathers took from the Word of God, the law itself, the law that will not change, the law that will never change. That's God's law. And when you go by it, uh, always, this does not give you an excuse to not do your best in whatever you attempt to do, but uh, be humble. That's what the Beatitudes were given in the beginning. Be humble and not prideful and let God bless you and you'll be able to do a lot. All right, God's word is the way to go. It will, when you please God, he will always bless you. He will, it makes a great difference in your life is to study God's word. And remember again, we're not teaching a multitude here, we're teaching the teachers. So but it's good for the multitude also to learn. All right, don't miss the next lecture. Bless your heart, you listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse eight, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. Then that 800 number is good from Puerto Rico throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, 1-800-643-4645, and Canada as well. If you have a question uh, spiritually uh, from our Father's Word and the message, ask it. Won't you do that? We could no longer answer all questions because of the millions of homes we go into. But we'll take a handful, yours could sure be there. Uh, those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, uh, it's always good to hear from you. Your announcer at the end of the, end of the hour will make, you, make our address known to you. Always good to hear from you. Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, 
denomination or organization, we're not going to judge people. We have one judge, that's our Father. All right, prayer request, we can do away with the number, we we'll do away with the address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. He, right now, He does. So let Him know that you love Him. That's the main thing He wants from you. Hosea 6.6, 6. I don't want your burnt offerings. I want your grace, your love. So let Him know you love Him. That's why He created you. Is because He loves you and receive his blessings. Father, around the world we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. We're going to go with Richard from Texas. Uh, question, does the Bible tell us if the Kenites of this world age followed Satan in the first world age? Well, we, we know one thing. We know that our Father is always fair and just. So naturally, whatever you are born into, you deserve from the first earth age. But the beauty is everyone, even a Kenite, has the opportunity to turn to Almighty God and become a child of God. I don't care who you are, you, you have the opportunity to work your way out of it. He, he paved the road. He cut the path showing you how to get it done, how to be blessed, how to follow him. So that really, there is no excuse. But the Kenite, they're not doomed. All they have to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and, and denounce uh, the traditions of men. And they become, instead of a Kenite, which is a Hebrew word that means the children of Cain, they became a child of the living God. Uh, God created all souls, and he, he makes no bones about that. Uh, Ruth from Arkansas. My question, will the Antichrist have nail prints in his hands and feet? The Antichrist wasn't nailed to the cross, was he? No, he wasn't. But don't put anything, don't put anything past. He's very wise, and he works miracles. Uh, besides, um, it, um, we, we know... One thing we know from, what is it, Revelation chapter 1, verse um, 7, or somewhere along there, it says, those even that, uh, that pierced him shall see him return. Uh, the true Christ, that is to say. But don't put anything past the false one. All you have to remember, he comes at the sixth trump. Christ doesn't return until the seventh. A child can count from one to seven. So you're really without excuse regardless of what Satan tries to pull. He comes at the sixth. He comes first saying, I'm going to fly you away. And he's ready. A lot of people are going to jump on his wagon. Mary from Kentucky. In the Bible, it says old men will dream dreams and young men shall see visions. Will you explain this? Well, you're, you're talking about what was stated on Pentecost Day, which was not in a foreign tongue or an unknown tongue. It was in the language spoken by the Holy Spirit that every language of the world could understand. I don't care if you were Chinese, Japanese, um, English, uh, Spanish. It all came out cloven, meaning in many directions. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. And, um, but it didn't say only me, old men and boys. It said my handmaids, my, the girls, the women, are going to prophesy. They're going to teach whether men like it or not, okay? You can read that in, in Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 6 down through about 10. Or you can go where it came from, the great book of Joel, in Joel chapter 2, where it speaks of the very coming of the Lord Jesus Christ as the locust swarm uh, all over the east. Victoria from Arizona. If you sin as a Christian, is there any sin you can commit that will not be forgiven? If you are one of God's elect and, and you refuse the Holy Spirit an opportunity to speak through you as you'll learn in the 24th chapter of this book of Matthew or the 13th chapter of Mark, that's the unpardonable sin. You can read of it in Luke chapter 12 verse uh, 10. And uh, it will stipulate there. But right at this moment, nobody has committed a sin that cannot not be forgiven. But we are not to judge. God is the judge. Gene from California. 
I heard you say Eve was not uh, created by a rib of Adam. <clears throat> Will you please explain this? Well, it's uh, really quite simple. It's real easy. Take that word that is translated rib in the English. Take it back to the Hebrew and see, what does it say? It says curve. Doesn't, it does not say rib. Now, what then was taken from Adam, we didn't know then, but we know now about the helix curve of DNA. And I truly believe that God took the helix curve, the feminine DNA from Adam and created Eve. It was not a rib. We men still have all our ribs that uh, God gave us in the beginning. But that curve, that feminine curve, is, um, I'm tempted, I was, is gone, supposedly, from man and given to beautiful women. Okay, D Dwayne from Ohio. My question concerns the rapture. You said the first taken would be the Antichrist. Would you explain this, please? Thank you. Well, it's written in Ezekiel chapter 13 that God said, hey, in the end times, the daughters of Jerusalem, which means the, the, the true children, will cover, they'll sew kerchiefs and they'll cover every knuckle in my outreach saving arms and teach people to fly to save their souls. And I'm against it, he says. God knew a long time ago what would go down. And then he made it very plain that the false Christ would come first. And why, why is it written in Matthew 24, Mark 13, that a mother will d deliver her daughter up to death? Who is death? That's the devil. You can read that in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. It's that old devil, Christ came to this earth to die on the cross to destroy um, the, um, the old devil, to destroy death, which is the devil. Okay. A, a mother that thinks that the false Christ is the true Christ is going to go to him and beg him to save their daughter that knows the truth and knows he's a fraud. She's going to beg him. She's, going, she's confused. She's a good girl. She studied the Bible. She should know, but she thinks you're the Antichrist. And he'll say, well, bring her to me. And mama brings the little baby, right, uh, daughter, right to the false Christ uh, to be delivered up. Well, to say what? We're going to go out of here. So you bet. The Antichrist comes first. Uh, Christ is not flying Christians out of this earth. He's coming here to teach them for a thousand years. So um, you need to read God's word if you are confused about the so-called rapture. The word rapture is not in the Bible. Okay. Uh, so I would hate to hinge and bet my entire soul and eternal life on a word that wasn't even in the Bible. Mike from Alabama, who wrote Revelation and was that person a prophet? Uh, our Heavenly Father wrote all of, of the Bible, okay? All of the approved Word of God. Now, if you want to ask me who the scribe was that set it to pen, it was St. John, okay? John, St. John of the disciple, the same John that wrote the three epistles of John, and from the Isle of Patmos, he wrote the book of Revelations. He scribed it, but God was doing the talking, okay? All he was was a scribe. Julie from Indiana. How can a woman be a preacher when the Word of God says a woman should not teach the Word of God or show authority over a man? Well, you know, there is much confusion in God's Word. It states very clearly in God's Word, not that a woman should be silent. That word silent is chatter in the Greek tongue. A woman should not chatter in church, and neither should a man. I won't allow anybody to chatter when God's Word is being taught. Women get a bad trip from that. You know, um, there was one man at one time uh, that had four daughters, four virgin daughters. Virgin meaning they had never known a man, but they were prophetess. And from Gaza, all the way up through Caesarea, they converted people. Do you know that Israel never took that particular part, but those four women did, along with their father. 
and uh, certainly they did a fantastic job. I guess God forgot to tell them what some preachers would teach, that women should remain silent and are too ignorant to look in the manuscripts and find out that the word is chatter. And it, it hurts a lot of people. You can also read in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, or chapter 11, make that, uh, along about the tenth and preceding the tenth verse, that a woman should remain, uh, should have the covering over her head when she prophesies. Prophesies means to teach. Do you know what that covering is? Read the tenth verse. It says, because of the angels, meaning the fallen angels that are returning back to this earth. So you can't take it away that in the end times, God will use both men and women and quite frankly, always has. You know, I, I can study and think uh, how some people like to put women down, but I don't know one person that doesn't have a mother. I, I wonder how they would get here otherwise if it wasn't for women. I, I would be very careful when I, if I were talking about God's creation. He loves them. I do too. Um, Okay, Andrew from Texas. Uh, is the sin described in the second epistle of John, verse 11, forgivable? Um, I've been asked this question, I'm worried a great deal. Um, St. John, chapter, the second epistle has only one chapter, and in verse 11 it says, if somebody that teaches a message other than Christ's word uh, brings another doctrine that if you as much as wish them God's speed, you become a partaker of their evil deeds. That, that's forgivable. That's not listed as the unpardonable sin. And, and um, it, is, it is human nature for Christians to want to wish people well. But when you support false teachings uh, past that point, then I, I would be a little bit concerned. I certainly would be. Uh, you can, again, you can read that in the second epistle of John. That's one of the little short ones, the shortest one. It's only, uh, and in that 11th verse, it does say, if somebody brings another doctrine, and if you as much as wish him Godspeed, you become a partaker of their evil works. Uh, Christ said he's coming here. I'd be very careful of teaching some, hearing someone teach, you're going somewhere else, because it's not true. Uh, Billy Jean from Indiana, were all buildings and structures destroyed in the first earth age? Yes. Your documentation for that you'll find in Jeremiah chapter 4 following the 18th verse. What God is telling them there concerning the first earth age, he said, hey, don't push me. This is what is meant. And I'll, I will um, paraphrase in, in for the truth. He said, don't, don't push me. Because once before, I destroyed the age, all people, all buildings, all cities, everything. I destroyed that first earth age. So don't mess with me if you think I won't do it again. Uh, Father was kind of letting that be a little bit of a, 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 a correction for those that would not listen to him. You'll find that again in Jeremiah chapter 4. I like that 18th verse, if I remember correctly. It says, my children are just a little bit sottish, which means my children are a little bit on the stupid side. They don't study enough. And that's why I destroyed it before. I hope I don't have to do it again. David from Texas, how long will the Antichrist reign on earth? Revelation chapter nine, five months. And he, he does better than give you the five months. He says, it's through the time of the locust, which is from May through September, that five-month stage of the locust right here on earth. Uh, Paul from Mississippi. Why does God allow false preachers? Oh, God doesn't. People do. God, God doesn't allow them. But God will always, he, he sent you a letter, and he sent preachers a letter. All they have to do is study it and teach it as it is written. But if somebody gets uh, bad ideas and traditions of men and tries to work that into a ministry, 
And if you listen to it, it's your fault. It's not God's. You see, God has given everybody free will except his election. Because he wants to know something. He will not interfere with that. He wants to know whether you're going to read the letter he sent you with understanding and, and love him. Or are you going to follow Satan again? Or are you going to follow people, earth age? Or are you going to follow him? That's, that's what he wants to know. Because you know why? We have a third earth age coming. He doesn't want any crooks there. He doesn't want anyone there that will offend his children. He's going to get rid of them. So therefore, this is why he allows uh, false preachers to, if people will listen to them, because they're going to pay a price for it, but he wants them to know they did it on their own. Because he sent them a letter telling them how to, how to disprove how to do what is right, how to love him, and how to follow him. And, um, and has given it in many languages where people can understand all the way around the world. And he sends teachers likewise that go all the way around the world. So there you got it. God doesn't uh, allow false preachers or make them. Man does. Uh, Terry from Louisiana. When we die, do we automatically go to heaven? Absolutely. Good, bad, and the ugly. Every, I mean, just the moment the silver cord parts, as it's written in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 6 and 7, your, spiritual, your spirit, which is the intellect of your soul, meaning your soul in your spiritual body, returns to the Father that gave it. Jesus made it very clear that even the wicked return instantly back to heaven to paradise is what it's called, but there is a gulf in the middle of paradise. The bad are on one side, the good are on the other. Uh, it really isn't a, a very uh, much of a stretch for truth to know we've only got one judge. And whether you're good, bad, or ugly, you've got to go to that one judge so that he can, where he, whereby he will judge you face to face. That's heaven. Wherever God is, that's heaven. If he comes to earth, heaven is on earth. Jim from Ohio. Was the rapture theory invented in 1833 by, 32 by Mary McDonnell? Why does Ezekiel 20 say that God does not want his people to fly? Well, it, I have to correct you. It's not Ezekiel 20. It's Ezekiel 13 where God says this. Okay, how did this happen so many years ago? Father knows what people are pretty well going to do, okay? They did it once before. So the Father had no way. He's always going to warn us. That's why he wrote the letter. There are hints, if you want to really go deep enough, um, to past 1832, that there were some people still teaching it. But uh, basically, the brethren picked it up in 1832 from Margaret MacDonald. She's that any moment, uh, and she also, um, uh, well, I'll let it go at that. We have that in the uh, incredible cover-up if anybody wants to read it for themselves. Sam from Oregon. Since there were no J's in Hebrew, where did the name Jesus come from? English. You know, different languages have different uh, pronunciations. But a good interpreter always translates it back as it should be. But when, when you're speaking English, if you didn't use J's, uh, there would be many words you wouldn't understand. Um, in the Hebrew, there are no J's. If you, uh, Jesus in Hebrew is Yeshua. Okay, Yeshua. Uh, let's take the word Julia. You do not, in the Hebrew, pronounce Julia as Julia. It's Yule. Yule. Okay? And um, because of the alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet only has 22 letters plus five uh, 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 outstanding letters, I'll call them. And, uh, and so it is. Uh, that's, the, that's the way our Father has it. But this is the beauty of the Holy Spirit speaking through God's elect. It goes out in every language of the world. And, uh, and so it is. 
a teacher must teach in the language that his audience understands or he would need an interpreter to do the teaching for him. So, and so there you go. Charles from Illinois, I heard you say that Cain was not Adam's son. Can you please explain this because it is not what I read in Genesis chapter 4 verses 1 and 2. Thank you. What did you read in Genesis chapter 4 verse 1 and 2? Um, Adam knew his wife, she conceived and, and bare a son and she said, with Yahweh I've received a child. What does verse 2 say? It says again, but that word again in the Hebrew is she continued in labor and gave birth to Abel. Okay. They were twins by two separate fathers. How, how can you tell? Well, look at Adam's genealogy and tell me where Cain is written in it. It isn't. Okay. Cain's genealogy is given in Genesis 4. Adam's genealogy is given in Genesis 5. You will not find Cain in his genealogy. This is why Jesus, when, when um, he said in St. John chapter 8, uh, to the Kenite, you're of your father the devil in the deeds he will do. I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying God's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. But most of all, God loves you for it. It's the letter he sent to you so that man cannot confuse you, that you can understand his word. Makes his day. When you make his, boy, is he going to make yours. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, listen to me and you listen good. You stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, he is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.